I trust, friends, that you have your Bible turned now to the third chapter of the book of Isaiah. And we'll begin there with the third chapter. And in this chapter, the emphasis is upon the prophecy concerning the cause of Israel's undoing at that time, that is, at the time of Isaiah, and until the end of the age. And what we have is weak and womanish government and loose and low morals. These are the two that brought this nation to the place where God delivered them into captivity. Now, this is still a section of judgment. And this judgment is leveled in particular against the nation Israel. We are still talking about them. Now, it does have application, of course, to other nations, but the interpretation is definitely to the nation Israel. And we are going to find out when we get a little farther along in Isaiah that there are prophecies concerning the judgment of the nations that were round about. And frankly, that to me is one of the most remarkable prophecies that you'll find in the Word of God. No one could guess what would happen to the nation in the future, any nation, and especially when the judgment of one would be altogether different than the judgment of the other. You see great evidence of fulfilled prophecy in Tyre and Sidon. We'll see that when we get to it and Babylon, another place. Now, we find out, though, that God's judgment against Israel is more severe and intense than it is against any other nation. And someone would ask, why would he do that? Well, this nation enjoyed a particular and peculiar relationship to God. This was a nation he had chosen. And privilege always creates responsibility. I believe that God will judge the United States more severely than he'll judge India and China, for that matter, today. Why? Well, simply because of the fact that we're a nation of privilege. We've had opportunity to know the Word of God as no other nation has had except Israel. Now, the nation Israel had more light, and light rejected brings always very severe and serious punishment. And this is going to be illustrated in this particular book. Now, I know that there are some today that will be rather squeamish, push away from it and say they don't like it. Well, maybe you won't, but please don't hide your head like the proverbial ostrich under the sand. Let's face reality and facts. Whether you like it or not, God's going to judge sin, and it's not only is he going to, he has, my friend. And we're going to see that when the judgment of God comes, he makes no apology for it, and that it is a severe judgment. Now, maybe you don't like it, but it just happens to be in the book, friends. Not only for the past, that's already fulfilled, but it's in there for the future, too. Now we see this prophecy. Here's a picture of Isaiah's day. It's now fulfilled in our day. And actually, that'll not exhaust its meaning, because these conditions will prevail again in the end times and will bring down the wrath of God and judgment upon not only this nation, but the nations of the world. Now, this chapter deals with the subject of weak government and women's dress. That's an interesting thing, but you're going to find out that I'm quite a square. If you haven't found it out before, you'll sure find it out in this chapter here. And I make no apology for it, because you want to know something. God is a square also. That is, according to the sophistication of the present hour. Now, these two things, weak government and women's dress, seem to be totally unrelated subjects. We're going to find out that that was not exactly as far removed as we might think it is. Now, in the first 15 verses here, weak government is caused by the lack of leadership as evidenced by women rulers. And we'll see what he means by that. 
verse 1, and I'm reading now. For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, doth take away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stay and the staff. That would be bread and water. The whole stay of bread and the whole stay of water. Now, we find that a man doesn't live by bread alone, but he sure needs it. And we find that this is a judgment of God, and it's a famine. There are 13 famines mentioned in the Word of God, and every one of them is a judgment from God upon the nation Israel. Now, in verses 2 and 3, "...the mighty man and the man of war, the judge and the prophet and the prudent," that is, the wise man, "...and the ancient," that is, maturity, "...and the captain of fifty, and the honorable man, and the counselor, and the cunning artificer, and the eloquent orator. All these have also failed, and there's not only a famine of bread, but there's a famine of leadership. Qualified men for high positions were lacking, and this likewise is a judgment from God. Now, I wonder if we could bring this maybe up to date. Have you been impressed today that there are no great men and that there are quite a few that are passing today as great men that would be pygmies in the days of Lincoln or Teddy Roosevelt or Washington and the man who wrote the Declaration of Independence. We have, and I say it very kindly, and I'm not talking about any particular party, we have a great many ambitious young men and older men also who have apparently no qualification as statesmen. A hundred years ago, they would have been called sheep politicians. But we hear them called statesmen. And there are other names for them, too. And the mighty man we have, the man of war. We have no great general. There is a lacking of leadership. The army wouldn't be in the situation it's in if we had strong leadership. And the crime wave is due to the fact that we have pygmies sitting on the seat of judgment and the prophet and the prudent, the ancient. We don't have statesmen at all. We have a group of clever politicians who know how to compromise. And I'm not talking about party. I'm just saying that this is always the mark, not only of a decadent age, but this is a judgment of God upon a nation when they're not producing great men. You move into the field of the arts. I get rather bored at these talk television programs, and generally the leader of it, he comes on by saying, I want to introduce to you a great artist, a genius. And some little peanut comes on and strums a guitar and doesn't play music at all, just yells at the top of his voice, and he's a genius. Or some man comes on, and he's a great literary light, and he's written a dirty book. My friend, we just lack it today, but we're not willing to admit it because of the fact that we're proud. we become a proud nation, as was said a few years ago. In the days of John Paul Jones, they had wooden ships but iron men. And today we have iron ships and paper dolls. That's our leadership, friend. Is a string of paper dolls. And that's true in every field at all. We used to think that, my, the educators, they have the solution to the problems of the world. When I was in college, that was it. Why, the educators can't even control their own campuses. Now, will you notice, the Lord says, verse 4, "...and I will give children to be their princes, and babes shall rule over them." And there's some of them that, my friend, as far as ability is concerned, still should have on their deities that are in high position. Juvenile adults are the rulers, totally incompetent. And that's what took Israel down the drain in that day and sent them into captivity. They have the mental level of children. And this is a judgment from God. Now, will you notice verse 5? "...and the people shall be oppressed, every one by another." and every one by his neighbor. And child shall behave himself proudly against the ancient and the base against the honorable. 
My friend, I think Isaiah is talking about today. But this was true in his day, that the child, the little college student, is saying, listen to me. I've got something to say. I've been listening to him for years. I haven't heard anything yet. But that is what we have today. And there is one class set against another class. The people shall be oppressed, every one by another. And a group of minorities, they want to inflict on you and me their way. And we're a minority too. But as Christians, we're not being listened to today. Maybe we do need to get organized also. But what a picture. And then, listen, verse 8. For Jerusalem is ruined. And Judah is fallen. Now, that's what the prophet said. And there are not many that are standing up and pointing at our nation and saying our cities today are ruined. And there's no question about that. And Judah is fallen. What a picture it is of the nation. Because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord to provoke the eyes of his glory. Now, God judges nations in their relationship to him. And here, this is the key to the chapter, and it's the key to the ruin of that nation, and it's the key to the ruin of any nations. Our problem is God has been run out of Washington. He can't even get voted to be the street sweeper in Washington. He can't even become the garbage collector. In any of our cities, God is ruled out in every area of life, and little man A few little peanuts think they can rule the world. Oh, how we need to be humbled. And I think that we've been humbled. Russia has humbled us. China's humbled us. North Vietnam has humbled us. We're being humbled all over the world. And we don't wake up. We still go along merrily in our way. And we're coasting downhill on a godly ancestry, as Dr. Machen put it. Now, will you notice verse 9? The show of their countenance doth witness against them, and they declare their sin is Sodom. They hide it not. Woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. Now, here is the picture. They sin out in the open. What used to be done in the backyard, today's done out in the front yard. What was done under cover is now done today in the open. And People like to say, well, we're honest. No, you're not honest at all. You're still the same hypocrite that our fathers were and that we were in our day. Same kind of hypocrites that we were. We hid the sin. But you're a hypocrite because you're doing it out in the open and you're trying to say that it's good because that is exactly... Notice what he says, verse 10. "...say ye to the righteous that it shall be well with him." for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. Now, God promises to deliver his people. He promised to deliver Israel. He has. He's kept them as a nation. God has promised that he'll deliver his people at any time. Now, in verse 11, "'Woe unto the wicked! It shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hand shall be given him.'" God is saying here, "'Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap.'" Now, he goes on. He says, "'As for my people,' Children are their oppressors. What has caused the greatest problem today? Well, it's juvenile delinquency on the college campus. The criminal element are the young people. All you need to do is read your paper. Children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. Oh, will the women's lib love Isaiah? And they're not going to like me much better. Oh, my people... They which lead thee cause thee to err and destroy the way of thy paths. Women are ruling over them. Are men that are effeminate, and I'm not quite sure what it is, and I think it's a little of both. Now, as far as I'm concerned, the women's lib movement is a sign of a decadent age. When women want to act like men... It's not good, my friend, because it's not women coming up to a high level, but they're coming down to man's level. And somebody says, you still believe in the double standard. My friend, if we don't have it, we're gone as a nation, because it's not in the heart of man to do right or to do good. And woman has given a certain amount of tenderness. And when she becomes as blasé and as brutal 
as the man, she actually will become worse than he is. And then a nation goes down. That was true in Israel. It'll be true in our nation, and it's been true in every nation. And all you've got to do is go to Rome and visit the ruins of Pompeii and the others, and you'll see what took them down, what removed them from the earthly scene, a nation that ruled the world. It went down, not because somebody outside got to them. They fell from within. Now, we come to something here that's quite interesting. And this has to do, by the way, as we will come to it in a moment, women's dress. But listen to the Lord now. He's going to plead with his people. The Lord standeth up to plead and standeth to judge the people. The Lord will enter into judgment with the ancients of his people and the princes thereof. For ye have eaten up the vineyard, the spoil of the poor is in your houses. Now, God here blames it upon the elders. The problem actually today is not a juvenile problem. It's an adult problem. It's really a senior citizen problem in one way, although most of us are removed from the scene of actions. And then... There were those in his day, a few, trying to get rich and rule over everyone else. And the spoil of the poor is in your houses. Now, I think godless capitalism and godless labor are the big problem in this nation of ours. And godless capitalism is just as bad as godless labor is for that matter. The whole problem is we're away from God. And God says he's standing up. He's ready to plead, or he's ready to judge. And he's going to let this nation, as he led his own people, he's going to let us make the determination. We can have it either way, but he's going to do one or the other. Now we come in verse 16, and this is women's dress. Now this is an area I've never moved in, and I'll move through here rather softly. But it doesn't sound like I'm moving very softly. Will you listen to this? And I'm going to read this. Moreover, verse 16 now to 24, Moreover the Lord said, Because the daughters of Zion are haughty, and they walk with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go. Oh, what a picture of womanhood. And now the problem, of course, is in the heart. Simon Peter, in 1 Peter 3, 1, says, In the same manner, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the behavior of the wives. The wife is try to win her husband. If she finds out she can't, she's certainly not to take abuse from it. While they behold your chaste conduct coupled with fear. Now, that doesn't mean you take abuse from it. It means the life that you're living before it. Whose adorning, let it not be that outward and adorning of braiding of the hair and of wearing of gold or putting on of apparel. If you have to hold your husband with sex, you are not going to hold him, friends, because the day is coming when he won't be interested. And that day, you've really lost him. I've always told young couples that there are three cords that hold marriage together, and a threefold cord's not easily broken. There is the physical. It should be there. It's important. There is also the mental, same interests, psychological, and the spiritual. And if only the physical is there, when that's broken, friends, it's gone. And that's what Peter's saying. It should be the life and not the clothes that are put on the back. In other words, a woman shouldn't be a clothes horse, and that's all. Now she's walking and mincing as the go and making a tinkling with her feet. Therefore the Lord will smite with a scab the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will discover their secret parts. And do you know there's an epidemic of venereal disease in our nation right now? I tell you, these that look so delicious, when you look at them, may I say to you, it's like a serpent along the way. Many a man is finding it out to his sorrow. In that day, the Lord will take away the bravery of their tinkling ornaments about their feet, their calls, their round tires, like the moon, the chains, the bracelets, the mufflers. And I only thought cars had mufflers, but 
Here, women have mufflers in that day, the bonnets, the ornaments of the legs, and the headbands, and the tablets, and the earrings, and the rings, and nose jewels, the changeable suits of apparel, and the mantles, the wimples, and the crispin pins, the glasses, the fine linen, the hoods, and the veils. It shall come to pass that instead of sweet smell, there shall be stink. And instead of a girdle, a rent. And instead of well set their baldness. And instead of a stomacher, a girding of sackcloth and burning instead of beauty. I tell you today, as in that day, women's dress is the barometer of any civilization. And the women's dress, when it's modest, tells something concerning the nation. And women's dress today is immodest. Oh, I know I'm a square. I recognize that. But listen, 20 articles of women's dress are mentioned by name. There is nothing wrong with a woman dressing in style. And I believe she ought to. I think all of us ought to look the best we can with what we've got to work with. Some of us don't have much to work with, but we ought to look the best we possibly can. But that's not what he's talking about here. The difficulty was with the inner life. They were haughty. They were brazen. Real adornment is beneath the skin, not from the skin outwards. Woman's dress is the key to a nation's morals, always. Now, verse 25 and 26. The man shall fall by the sword. And how many did we lose in Vietnam? May I say to you, one political party blames it on another. And it's the sin of us, all of us as a nation. And thy mighty in war, and her gates shall lament and mourn. And she being desolate shall sit upon the ground. And friend, the bombs are yet to fall upon our nation. But they're coming. They're coming. Oh, I know today that we feel very comfortable and very much compromised in the world. But they're coming. There was a Roman medal that showed a woman weeping. The insignia was Judea Capta, or she went into captivity. What a picture of that nation. Now, friends, we're in this section of Isaiah, and we put in it chapter 4. That is one complete prophecy, beginning with Isaiah 2 and going through Isaiah 5. And here you have a synopsis, actually, of the entire book of Isaiah in these chapters here, because he touches all the bases that he'll be touching on in the rest here. Now, as we come to chapter 4, again, may I repeat, it's a continuation of the prophecy that was begun in chapter 2. And the conditions that are set before us here were the conditions that prevailed at the time of the Babylonian captivity, and also they will be the conditions during the Great Tribulation period right before the setting up of the kingdom. This is a very brief chapter. It's only six verses, one of the briefest in the book. And it is descriptive of conditions which did prevail at the time of the Babylonian captivity. Now, the structure of this chapter is very simple. The first verse is the only one that depicts conditions during the time of the Great Tribulation period, the last days. And the remainder of the chapter sets before the reader the preparation that will be necessary for entering the kingdom. And this section, of course, is entirely anticipatory. Now, we have, therefore, in the first verse here, we have conditions prevailing because of the frightful casualties of war. And that will be those conditions in the time of the Great Tribulation. And it's been true in all wars also. I'm reading verse 1. And in that day, seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, We will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. In other words, because the population, the manpower population has been decimated by war, there'll be a surplus of women. And it will be to such an extent that seven women will be willing to share one man in that day. And they'll all of them be willing to hold down a job. 
I suppose a man will do nothing in the world but just keep books for the rest of them and make sure that they, you know, turn in their proper share. But it reveals the awful conditions that will prevail. And it's a situation that, to a certain extent, prevails today. It was true after World War II in a very special way for a while, and it's true today. I understand there's something like a surplus now of 80,000 women. When I heard that the other day on radio, I told my wife she better be very careful and take care of me a little bit more, you know, with a little more concern, because I told her there just weren't enough men to go around. Well, that brings me now to verse 2 through 6, and these are conditions preparatory to establishing the kingdom. And verse 2, "...in that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel." And you'll notice that we have a reference here to in that day. In verse 1, it was in that day. And now in verse 2, in that day. Now, that will occur again and again in Isaiah and in all of the prophets. And it'll be mentioned in the New Testament. The day of the Lord. Joel will have something to say about it. It begins, as every Hebrew day always began at sundown, begins with darkness, and it moves from darkness to the dawn. And it begins with the great tribulation period and goes on into the millennial kingdom. So that we have here a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ, for he is the branch. Now, this word, the branch here, there are actually 18 Hebrew words that are translated by the one English word, the branch. All of them refer to the Lord Jesus. Here it means it's just a sprout. Now, I'll be speaking of this in a great deal of detail when we get over to the 11th chapter of this book, and I'll pass by it now. But the Lord Jesus Christ is the branch. He is here the sprout. He's a branch out of a dry ground. We're going to be told later on. Here is something green that sprung up in the desert. We'll talk about that later. But the reference is definitely to him. Now in verse 3, it shall come to pass that he that is left to Zion, and he that remaineth in Jerusalem shall be called holy, even everyone that's written among the living in Jerusalem. In other words, God's people, both Israel and the Gentiles, during the Great Tribulation, will survive that period. The Lord Jesus Christ made it very clear. He expressed it in a way that actually has always seemed strange, but he's looking at it, of course, at the end of the Great Tribulation period, And he says, "...he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved." Well, they were sealed at the beginning of the tribulation to make sure they got through. And the shepherd is able to keep his own, his sheep, and therefore they're going to endure unto the end. That's what he's saying here. You have that same thought, of course, when you get over to the book of Revelation. They are the ones, that great company that was sealed at the beginning of the great tribulation, they come through, and they come through that period. Now, in verse 4, "...when the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion, and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning." You see, God's people must be prepared to enter the kingdom. That brings up a very pertinent question, does it not, for you and me today? Are you fit today for heaven? Right now, suppose God took you to heaven as you are right now. Would you be fit for heaven? I can't answer it for you, but there's going to have to be a great deal of repair work done on Vernon McGee to make him ready for heaven. And that is what life is all about. It's just a school preparing you for eternity. A great many people think this is all, and they're making a 
very sad mistake. Preparation is being made here for eternity. And the question is, and it's something for you to think about, maybe in your odd moments or when you're lying on your bed at night, are you fit for heaven? Suppose God took you to heaven as you are right now. Would you be a square peg in a round hole? I'm afraid that I would. And that's the wonderful thing. Beloved, it doth not yet appear what we shall be. He's going to have to make some changes. Verse 5. And the Lord will create upon every dwelling place of Mount Zion, upon her assemblies, a cloud and smoke by day, and the shining of a flaming fire by night, for upon all the glory shall be a defense. Now the glory of God will be upon every house in the kingdom, not just on the temple. What a glorious thing it'll be. Verse 6, And there shall be a tabernacle for a shadow in the daytime from the heat, and for a place of refuge and a covert from the storm and from rain. In other words, security will come to the nation Israel in that day. And they today do not have peace. Therefore, this prophecy is not being fulfilled. They're not back in the land in fulfillment of prophecy. When they are, every man will dwell under his vine and his fig tree in peace. And notice here the order. Peace always follows grace and mercy and cleansing. You can't have peace in the world. And as we've said before, the problem has never been in a political party, and the problem has never been way over yonder in a foreign country. The problem is in the human heart today. We war because it's in our hearts. Man is a warlike creature today because he's a sinner, and he won't deal with that question. And when you deal with that question, you can then deal with the question of wars. When you settle one, we're going right into another. We've always done it, and we haven't changed. Now, when we come to chapter 5, the last in this series of one prophecy from chapter 2 to 5, you have the song of the vineyard and the six woes that follow. Now, this is a very wonderful section, by the way. The song of the vineyard is in the first seven verses, and then from 8 through 30, you have the six woes. Now, this section, by the way, it's sometimes called a parable of Jehovah's vineyard. I like to think of it as the psalm of Jehovah's vineyard. They tell me that in the original that it's a thing of beauty. I've tried to read it in the original, but when I read Hebrew, my friends, it's never a thing of beauty. And therefore, I would not attempt that. But the vineyard, we're told very definitely, is Israel. And that means all 12 tribes, though God was speaking to Judah here in particular. And he said that he had done everything that he could for the vineyard. He had put it to begin with in very fertile soil. He had fertilized it. He had irrigated it. He'd taken the weeds out. He had done everything to make the vineyard grow. But it just wouldn't bring forth anything but wild grapes and not very many of them. And therefore, God now says, I want the world to understand. I want my people to understand that I'm judging them, and that I'm just and righteous in my judgment of them. And God is. And as I said last time, all you and I have to do is to look at our own lives. And when we do, we recognize that whatever's come to us, God is righteous and just. Now, if you don't think so, you feel like, as I have felt many times, that God was being a little unfair to me and unjust. Then I became, well, I felt sorry for myself. I developed a complex of some sort that he was persecuting me, sort of a spiritual paranoid. Many of us are like that. But friends, I've come far enough in life, and I look back on those days when it was so dark and bleak, And I'm of the opinion that God permitted it because he was accomplishing a purpose in my life. And I praise him today for it. 
Now, may I illustrate with a very personal illustration? I was a very poor boy, and I went to college. I had no money, and I actually had my mother to support. And be very frank with you, I had to work, and I had to work very hard at a part-time job. I could go out for two or three hours in the afternoon, practice football, but I couldn't play on the team because I had to work. And I had to work every night. I worked at a newspaper. And I would sit down there when the Bulldog edition had come out many times after being busy for a period of two or three hours, and I'd have then a little time of rest. And I'd sit there and feel sorry for myself. And I think how terrible it is. I look back today, and I know why God made it that way for me, because I know myself well enough. And I know what happened to several other fellows that had plenty. One boy from a very wealthy family made the football team. He and I were very good friends, by the way. And I always envied him. I wondered why I couldn't have been in such a favorable spot. May I say that he got out of the ministry, and he is today a drunken insurance man. His wife has left him. And I'll be very frank with you. If you think Vernon McGee was any better than that, Father, you are wrong. I think he had a much stronger character than I had. And my friend, if I'd had the way to do it, I think I would have gone down that road. I'm sure I would. But I thank God today he wouldn't let me, and he made it hard for me, and he had to do it. And he did it for a purpose, and so I praise him for it. May I say that I'm of the opinion that many of us, as we look back on the past year, we have many regrets, but God's permitted many things to come in our lives that wasn't pleasant, and he's permitted it for a purpose. Now, I want to read this part right here, chapter 5, beginning with verse 1. I'm told that this is without doubt one of the most beautiful songs that's ever been written, that there's nothing actually quite like it. You have nothing to compare it to. It's a musical symphony, and it is absolutely impossible to reproduce it in English. It's truly a psalm. Will you listen Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. Now, there's nothing wrong with the soil, therefore. The problem is with the vineyard itself, that is, with the vine. Now, notice what he did. This vineyard, I think we need to determine right here and now what we're talking about. The vineyard is Israel. It's Judah. It is this people. It's not the church or something else. You don't have to guess at this. Verse 7, For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the man of Judah his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression, for righteousness, but behold, a cry. And that, of course, cry was a cry of persecution. Now, Notice what he's saying, and again, he's asking you to consider. Come into court and listen to it, and listen to him. And the minute that you listen to him and see his charge against the nation Israel, my friend, you'll find yourself condemned. It couldn't be otherwise. Will you listen? Verse 2, And he fenced it, and gathered out the stones thereof, planted it with the choicest vine, and built a tower in the midst of it, and also made a wine press therein. And he looked, and it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, between me and my vineyard. Now he asks these people to judge. And very candidly, friend, when you look at your own life, In that, are you ready to complain against God today? I know how I whined and howled when I got cancer. I felt like the Lord just was being unfair. Then I had the opportunity of lying alone on that hospital bed and looking at my own life. Friends, God wasn't wrong. (laughs) I was. I tell you, you and I need to face up to it. This idea today that we're something special. God's not going to do anything that's unjust. 
He's not going to do anything that's wrong. You and I are wrong. God is not wrong. Listen to him. Now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, between me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. And now go to, I'll tell you what I'll do to my vineyard. I'll take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down." You see, when God put them in the land there for 500 years, he put a wall around them and did not let anybody touch them, though many times he could have judged them. Then God says now in this, you're my vineyard, I'd hedged you in, but now I'm breaking down a wall. And Assyria came in, first Syria, then Assyria, then Babylon, then Egypt. They all poured in and they laid the land waste. And that land in spite of everything that's being done over there today, to me is a pretty desolate-looking place. God has judged it. Now he says, I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned nor digged, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. And the former and latter rains for over a thousand years did not fall in that land. That's the reason it's so desolate today. And the former rains, I understand, have begun, but not the latter. Now, will you notice in verse 7 again, "...for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the man of Judah his pleasant plant." I hope we won't make any mistake now. We don't have to guess who he's talking about. The vineyard is Israel. And that's one of the figures as the fig tree is of this nation. And he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression for righteousness, but behold a cry. Now, again, God is going to spell it all out. There are six woes that are mentioned here, and each one of these tell of a certain sin. And these are things that God is judging them for. And if you want to put these down on your life or the life of our nation, you can do it. But the interpretation is for Israel. It's already been fulfilled in their connection anyway. But It's something that we can make application to our own hearts and lives. Now, will you notice this? Woe unto them that join house to house, that lay field to field, till there be no place that they may be placed alone in the midst of the earth. Now, this is the first sin of Israel. And what is this? Well, this sin is the lust of the eye. And more specifically, it's covetousness. And covetousness, we're told today, is idolatry. That is, this is the big business here that's expanding at the expense of the little man. That's what happened in Israel. So that the little man was squeezed out. And all of this was done that great fortunes might be accumulated. Now, God will judge a people on that. The only excuse... For such expansion is the insatiable greed for more property and possessions. That is the story that you have here. And again, may I say, it is a sad story. Now he says in verse 9 here, "...in mine ears saith the Lord of hosts, of a truth many houses shall be desolate, even great and fair, without inhabitant. Yea, ten acres of vineyard shall yield one bath." And the seed of a homer shall yield an ephah. Now, what he's saying is simply this, that though they expand their lands, the yield will not be great because apparently a famine, then God will send famine as a judgment. It'll decimate the crop yield so that the extended holdings will not produce a bumper crop at all. And I was very much interested in reading an article the other day that this earth that you and I live on is running short of energy. We're running out of gasoline. We are running out of arable land today. And this matter of ecology is a real thing right now, by the way, because we're seeing that pollution is destroying so much of this earth. My friends, we're going to be on a desolate planet. 
one of these days. What's happening? God's judging this earth that we're on. We're running out of energy. Going to be out of gasoline one of these days. So if you're planning on a trip, you better take it now because there's going to be a shortage. Oh, I don't mean in our lifetime, but there are those that believe it will be in our lifetime. But the earth is running out of energy. And this is a judgment God made upon his nation in that. Now, the second woe is, Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, that continue until night to wine and flame them. The harp and the vial, the tabret and pipe and wine. That is, they go to the rock festivals and take their drugs and liquor along and their beer. But they regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operation of his hands. Drunkenness and pleasure on a national scale are the sins that are mentioned here. And it leads to the deadening of all spiritual perception. Now, it's reached that today. I notice that the news media does not release, as it did a few years ago, the number of alcoholics that we have in this country. If any of you see that around the first of the year, that's when it's released. But the last that I had, why, it was nearing the 10 million mark. That is probably today pretty close to the number of alcoholics that there are in this country. Now, there will be put in the paper about how much taxes the liquor industry pays. But the interesting thing is, all those taxes are absorbed in taking care of the alcoholics and uh, maintaining police forces to take care of the accidents of drunken drivers. And, of course, no one can pay for the lives of innocent victims that are taken today. And no one can understand how many decisions are made in our government by men who have just come from a cocktail party. These are the things that lower the morals of a nation, and this is the thing that destroys a nation. It eats at the vitals of a nation, and it is a cancer, therefore. Now, God very candidly says what's going to happen. Verse 13, Therefore my people are gone into captivity, because they have no knowledge. Now, we think today that it's rather sophisticated, and it's the thing to do to drink. And I've been very much interested in an article that I was reading, and the man that was interviewed is a man who is head, our director, of New York's Phoenix House, a therapeutic community for drug addicts. And one of the questions he was asked many, is there anything parents can do to prevent their children from turning to drugs? Now, will you listen to this? Because it's not given by a man that is a Christian. At least I take it that he's not. His answers would not indicate that. He says, of paramount importance is an attitude in the home of not using drugs, pills, or alcohol as a means of solving life's problems. This doesn't mean that the occasional social drink is taboo. Of course, he would not take that from you. But, he says, it means only that the old monkey-see, monkey-do rule is just as valid in this area as it is anywhere else. Youngsters who grow up in an atmosphere of drug abuse will be among the first to try marijuana or pills when confronted with their own problems. And may I say today, father, mother, <laughs> if you're drinking cocktails, and I see it as I travel across the country in many restaurants, if you're drinking a cocktail... Don't be surprised if Willie or Mary get on dope. They will probably move that direction. After all, why are you drinking? Why can't you settle for even a Coca-Cola? Or maybe settle for a cup of coffee. And yet they tell us those things have just a little potent lift in it. May I say to you that the drug problem among young people is not there 
it's been in the home among parents who have been drinking themselves to bolster up themselves to face life. That's what destroys the home. It destroys the nation. Now, I read this quotation so you'd know it was not just a poor preacher that was finding fault. I'm not. I'm just saying this is the condition of our nation today, and it brought this nation down. Now he says in verse 14, "...therefore hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure, and their glory and their multitude and their pomp, and he that rejoiceth shall descend into it." Now, I want to do something that I ordinarily do not do and probably ought not to do here. And it's to dwell on a word, and it's the word that is translated hell here. Therefore, hell hath enlarged herself. Now, that word is a word like baptism. It probably should never have been translated. In the Old Testament, it is Sheol, and in the New Testament, it is Hades. And it does not mean exactly what we think of it meaning today. Actually, the lost will end up in the lake of fire, as it's called in the book of Revelation. Now, it's called hell, but we need to find out the background of this word. The word comes from a root Hebrew word, Sheol does, that means to ask or demand. And you find it in the 30th of Proverbs, verse 16, where it says that there are several things that cry, not enough, not enough. And Sheol is one of them. Hell, never satisfied, or death, or the grave. And by the way, this can be translated any way like that, and it would be satisfactory. Actually, back of this is that question to ask. And when you stand at the grave of someone, what is the question? Where? Where is he? And Job sighs out that question. Man dieth and wasted away. Yea, man giveth up the ghost. And where is he? And where is he? The Hebrew word, vayo, vayo, it has a sound of a sigh. Where is he? And that's the question that everybody's going to have to ask. And therefore, hell at first did not have the idea of a locality, that is, of being down. In time, it was recognized that God was above. Therefore, this would be below. And the Lord Jesus used it in the New Testament when he said, Thou Capernaum, which art exalted to heaven, you shall be cast down to Hades, to Sheol, or to hell. And that doesn't mean there, I think, a literal descent into the heart of the earth. I think it meant that Capernaum was going to be brought down, and all you have to do is look at the ruins of that place today. Now, always there's strong moral ideas that attach to the term of direction. Up. Up always has a moral connotation. Up toward God and down toward hell, my beloved. And you can't escape those at all. And so here you have that, that the nation will be brought down. Reminds us, God says they're going to be taken into captivity. They're going to be brought down to the grave. And the glory of a nation goes into dust because of drunkenness and pleasure. Rudyard Kipling, he was a prophet as well as a poet, when he wrote in his recessional, Lo, all our pomp of yesterday is one with Nineveh and Tyre. Now, will you notice, we come now to the third woe. Verse 18, Woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity, and sin, as it were, with a cart rope. You could translate it like this. Woe to those whose wickedness is helped by words of lying, who in their pride and unbelief the wrath of God defying. would make a poem out of it, you see. This third woe is the third sin. This is the picture of a nation that's giving itself in abandon to sin without shame or conscience. 
They say, let him make speed and hasten his work that we may see it and let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw nigh and come that we may know it. In other words, they challenge God to do anything about it. And the very interesting thing here, no penalty is mentioned. And somebody says, well, why? Well, my friend, the very silence is frightful. The penalty is too awful to mention. And the history of the deportation of the nation to Babylon tells something of the frightful judgment of God upon a people who sin with impunity against him and defy God. God will judge them. Now, do you want to know something about what happened? In the 137th Psalm, they're asking eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. When they prayed that against Babylon there would come an enemy that would take their little ones and dash their heads against a stone to knock their little brains out. That's horrible. Horrible beyond word. That was the judgment that came to this people. My friend, God is a God of love. But when you reach the place where you defy Him, turn your back on Him, and there's no hope for you, judgment comes. And there are just too many instances in history that illustrate that, unless you want to shut your eyes to them. Now we have three woes in quick succession here. Woe to them, verse 20 now, woe to them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet. Now this is an attempt to destroy God's standards of right and wrong by substituting man's values which contradict God's moral standards. We have that today in marriage. I listened to a very beautiful little girl tell on television in an interview program that she was living with a man without marrying. And, and the reason given is that she was honest and didn't believe in hypocrisy. I have news for her. She's not only dishonest and she's not only being hypocritical, she knows that it's wrong in her own heart and that she should be married. And she's not honest. God says she's living in adultery, and God calls him an adulterer and her an adulteress. And I don't care, my friend, what you might think about it. That's what God says. Now, the fifth woe, woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. This is the sin of pride. And God said in Proverbs, as we saw, that that's number one on his hate parade. God hates pride. And then we have here the sixth one, "'Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine, and men of strength to mingle strong drink, which justify the wicked for reward, and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him.'" And this is a day that has its priorities mixed up. This is the day that is saying wrong is right and right is wrong. I remember memorizing a line years ago from the Great Divide because in my younger days I was in the little theater. And in the Great Divide, the hero there says, Wrong is wrong from the moment it happens till the crack of doom. And all the angels in heaven working overtime can't make it different or less by hair. My friend, wrong is still wrong. Now, he says, Therefore, as the fire devoureth the stubble, and the flame consumeth the chaff. Now, this is something that I think is quite remarkable that we have in the Word of God. The Lord Jesus gave this, and he was quoting from Isaiah, the 40th chapter, "...a bruised reed shall he not break, and smoking flax shall he not quench, till he send forth justice unto victory." You know, today there are certain sins that bring their own judgment. Drunkenness is one. Drug abuse is another. I could give, and don't have time today, many instances of how I've seen men sin, and that that sin would come home to them. And it works in their own lives, in their own families, their own bodies, their own lives, and destroys them. God doesn't have to do a thing. The smoking flax will break into flame, and that bruised reed's going to die anyway. And the very sin that we commit today is the sin that will destroy us. Now, 
He says, it'll be like a fire that devoureth the stubble. These last three woes produce an accumulation of penalties that break like a tornado, not only on this nation, but on all nations for that matter. This is put down a great principle by which God judges nations. Though the process of deterioration and rottenness is slow and unobserved, the penalty comes like a fire in the stubble. It's fast and furious and cannot be deterred. It's the anger of the Lord bursting forth in judgment. It moves the frightful judgment of God in the last days. Now, I remember when I was a young man in Nashville, Tennessee, a dentist that I went to, and he was a very good friend, told me one day about something that had happened a few years before in Nashville. He said, you know, one of the most reputable doctors in this city actually headed up the dope ring, and he was responsible for it. And it made it so difficult for the law to reach him because of his position. And one time he tightened up on the dope in order to get the price of it. He cut off the supply for a brief period of time. And the demand, of course, would push the price up. And during that time, his son and daughter both were brought home as drug addicts. He did not know it before. But the minute he cut off the supply, why, his son, it came out then, and his daughter, both of them. And that man had the shock of his life that apparently led to his death shortly after that. The thing is, God doesn't have to put his hand in and judge. In many instances, he just lets it take its course. And the sin of drinking, God doesn't do anything about it. I don't think God's joined the WCTU, but he doesn't have to. Drunkenness is going to bring judgment, and it's coming, and it'll come on the individual. It'll come on the nation. And those of us that have been in the ministry and pastorate over a period of years, we see this, and we've seen it down through the years. And by the way, may I say this, that there are those that get converted that have been hitting the bottle, and then they leave a bottle in the ice box just in case. May I say that that's the thing that leads many back into this awful sin, and that's the thing that Paul is saying in the 8th of Romans, in verse 12, when he says, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. And we do not have to make arrangements, Paul says, for the flesh. Make no arrangement for the flesh. Don't leave that bottle in there. Take that bottle out and break that bottle. May I say to you today that how many of us kid ourselves, and these are sins, And some of these sins, I'm sure, have touched all of us. Verse 25, he says, Therefore is the anger of the Lord kindled against his people. Now, this is a strange verse to many today that have been just talking about the love of God. The love of God's real, and you can't keep him from loving you. But God hates sin, friends. And if you are going to love sin, he'll love you. But the anger of the Lord is kenneled against his people. This is not against the neighbors. It's against his people. And he hath stretched forth his hand against them and has smitten them. And the hills did tremble, and their carcasses were torn in the midst of the street. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. If they'd come to him, trust him, God would deliver them. But may I say to you, the judgment of God is in the book of Isaiah and also the grace of God, the government of God and the grace of God. And they're not in conflict. But my friend, if you're going to continue in sin and you won't have the grace of God, then you're going to know what the government of God is. Now he goes on in the rest of this chapter and you see the accumulation of the judgment of God and Verse 30, the last verse reads, And in that day they shall roar against them like the roaring of the sea. And if one look unto the land, behold, darkness and sorrow, and the light is darkened in the heavens thereof. Now, all you have to do today, if you doubt that here were a people that had served God, 
and that judgment has not come. Go over and look at that land today. I don't see it as a great many people see it. A great many people go over and see it and they say, oh, isn't this wonderful? We're seeing the fulfillment of prophecy and the land is being reclaimed and all that. I see a people still in darkness. I see a people that are far from God. I see a people that need God today and they're not dwelling in peace. They're living in fear and in that land they're in grave danger today. And my heart goes out to them, by the way. May I say to you, the judgment of God. And as one poem has put it, We have not wept for thy grief, Israel, scattered, driven, shut up to darken unbelief, while we have heaven. We have not prayed for thy peace, Jerusalem forsaken, thy roots increase. By God's great grace we age long have partaken. How trod thy street, our Savior's feet? How fell his tears for thee? How loving him can we forget, nor long thy joys to see? Zion, thy God remembers thee, though we so hard have been. Zion, thy God remembers thee, with blood-bought right to cleanse. May he remove our prayerlessness, sin. May I say that I think expresses the thing that we have in this chapter here. God is punishing his own people. 